So, what we're going to look at tonight is going to set the scene for the series of talks which are to follow properly. Uh, and we're doing this at a time when creation is something which is a banned subject in the schools. It's uh, not a subject which is discussed at all in this country, on the media. It is more in America. But just at this time, there is so much evidence come forward to show the folly of evolution and to support this simple account in Genesis chapter 1 that tells us what God did in the beginning. And so what we're going to look at is this foundation stone. The Word of God has its basis, has the book of Genesis, and the very basis of that book of Genesis is the creation account, as given in chapter 1 of Genesis. And we believe that this is a record of truth. It comes from the only eyewitness. Man wasn't there. He has his own speculations because he doesn't want to believe in a God. But we believe that this record stands the account of truth. It fits the evidence that we find in the rocks of the earth. And the whole of scripture supports what is stated here in Genesis 1. That God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. We know what happens when we try to break up foundations of a building, the building crumbles. And that's true of the Word of God when, sadly, people try to move away from the simple account here and try and blend it with man's views, uh, theistic evolution especially, it then destroys the rest of the Word of God. Take away this foundation of truth and then the whole idea of salvation, of Jesus being the second Adam, uh, it just falls to the ground. So we're obviously going to wholeheartedly support what it says in Scripture. And Paul, writing to the Romans, tells us that God has left evidence of his creative work in the things that he has made. So that if we examine them, uh, and in this age the works of God have been examined in greater detail than ever before with all the advanced uh, technology that is available to man, and all the while, one sees complexity. Deeper and deeper one goes, more and more complexity, which can possibly have evolved. It points to a great designer, a creator. And what Paul is saying is, when you look at the world of nature, you can see that there is an almighty God. He has incredible powers. He is able to bring life where there was no life before. And not only that, he's able to sustain it so that year by year the world of nature uh, revolves around the seasons and reproduces and brings forth food for God's creation. So the, the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible, it is taken from the opening phrase, um, Bereshef, in the beginning. What we have as Genesis comes from the Greek which has the idea of origins or generations. And truly, the book of Genesis does have the origins of everything. Whether we look at time or space or matter, it tells us how that came into being under the hand of God. The earth and the universe and plants and animals and man, life, sin, death, language, seven-day week, all contained within the early pages of Genesis. Why there's marriage, why there's family life, why there's clothing. All these things are explained by the book of Genesis. And because we have an incredible God, we have an incredible creation in all its complexity and its beauty and its variety. It tells us of sin and the work of redemption and that way to the tree of life which was barred from Adam and Eve. But the rest of scripture reveals the way to the tree of life. And it reveals the seed in Israel in later chapters. So a, a wonderful genesis, origins, beginnings of, of everything. Now, we do seem to have two genesis accounts. Genesis chapter 1, running through to chapter 2 and verse 3. And then chapter 2, verse 4, to the end of the chapter, do seem to be two different accounts. But... Uh, we don't have a problem with the four Gospels. Four Gospels paint four different pictures, different aspects of the life of the Lord Jesus. And so these two accounts, not that we're going to be looking at the second one, um, gives us two different aspects about creation. 
So I'm not expecting to be able to read that, even from the front row. But the first section, which runs through, as I say, to verse 3 of chapter 2, uh, is all about God's work of preparation. He knows from the beginning what he's going to do. He's building the earth solely for the purpose of bringing glory to him through man being put upon the earth and through a process of probation reflecting God's glory and being rewarded with everlasting life. That's God's plan with the earth. So it's all about man and making the earth so that man can live and work upon it. Now the second creation account uh, is all about focusing on man. Man has now been made. And so God's work of redemption is now being unfolded. And in the second chapter, we have so much detail of how Eve was uh, made out of the side of Adam and all that, that signifies, and marriage and all the pointers that comes to the bride that God intends to have in the end of time when he will be all in all. So there's a different aspect. And it's interesting how in the first chapter it uses the word Elohim, and in the second, Yahweh Elohim. And um, we can see the reasonableness of that. That in the second section, when it's dealing with the work of redemption, then it's appropriate to talk about he who will be mighty ones. So, uh, an interesting two sections. But as I say, we're just looking at the first part of the first one. So, Genesis chapter 1 opens with this statement, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, that's an opening statement. Uh, and there's a closing statement, corresponding one to it. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So that's a closing statement. Uh, and everything in between tells us how we got from God creating uh, heavens and the earth without any form or shape to them, to an earth which at the end of six days was filled with life, was filled with animals and birds and man and trees and valleys and hills. That's what this chapter is all about. And it tells us step by step uh, how that happens. Uh, and in our authorised versions, every verse bar three begins with the word and, showing there is a linking. And in the Hebrew, every verse, apart from obviously the first verse, begins with the equivalent of our and. Showing this is a step by step by step. It sews it all together, verse by verse by verse. So we have a continuum from in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and that work was then finished six days later. And so we have this unfolding day by day by day by day. And, and God chose to create in seven days. He could have done it in seven minutes. But because this is done for the benefit of man, God chose to do it in a time frame that man could understand, a working week. This was God's working week, an incredible week, bringing forth everything, but in terms that we can understand. Now, I'm not saying that God was using a day in a symbolic sense. These were literal 24-hour days, it makes clear. But that he uses that time frame before the benefit of man, something that man can grasp and get his hands around. And you can see, this is the ivy, but all the ends, they just are everywhere in this, uh, this is just the first day, um, and connecting. So one thing is flowing on from another. No big gaps between verse 1 and verse 2. It's a continuous unfolding. That's how the Hebrew has been written so what is fundamental is that in the beginning includes the sixth day. Because when Jesus is talking about marriage, he says, Have you not read, he that made them at the beginning made them male and female. So the creation of Adam and Eve wasn't billions of years after the creation of the heavens and the earth. It was at the same time. In the beginning, God made them male and female. And uh, Isaiah reflects that in Isaiah chapter 45. Uh, I made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have I commanded. So absolutely no sense in there of there being long periods of time. 
God spoke, he stretched out the heavens, created man, all part and parcel of this work. And in the Ten Commandments, graven with the finger of God, uh, in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, sea, all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. So that is what God has told us he did. And in faith we are prepared to accept it. It makes sense. An omnipotent God who can create so wonderfully has the power to be able to create in six days. The Lord Jesus was able to perform miracles. What normally would take months to change water into wine was done in an instant. So we should have no problems. And the seventh day, um, the summary at the end makes it clear that at the end of the seventh day when God had rested well no I'm sorry two verse one was before the seventh day the end of the sixth day the end of the sixth day and the seventh day was the day of rest thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made so the work was finished and with the seventh day forming the completeness of the seven-day cycle, then the work of God was ended. And that word finished and ended is exactly the same word in the Hebrew. So, at the end of the seven days, we've got all the preparation needed for there to be man living and working and uh, existing upon the earth. We've got an earth, we've got light, We've got water, we've got an atmosphere, we've got plants, we've got planets and stars, we've got birds and fish, we've got animals, and finally on the sixth day, we've got man himself. Everything needed for God's work to proceed. So, let's go through these uh, first six days uh, and, and see this wonderful picture that this is the beginning of God's work. There is a final ending which we get to in the book of Revelation when God is all in all and all will be immortal upon the earth uh, and that work of creation will have been finished completely in every aspect. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what's interesting is how abruptly this account starts. It doesn't tell us anything about God. It doesn't tell us who he was or how he came into being or anything about him. It just says, I'm God created the heavens and the earth. But of course this was written, we believe, for the children of Israel. And they knew all about God. They had experienced his hand in the wilderness. They had seen his dramatic power portrayed in Egypt. They knew who God was, and they worshipped God. And so there was no need to explain at the beginning who God was. God was somebody that they understood, that mighty power that has saved them from the Egyptians. And we know that if we read the word of God, we will come to the same knowledge that the children of Israel did about the mighty power of God. And so we can too come to know about God through the pages of his word. Now, 31 times in Scripture, we have this phrase, uh, heavens and the earth. Sorry, 51 times we have combinations of heaven and earth. 31 times we have heaven and earth. 12 times the heavens and the earth. Uh, once heaven, earth and heaven. And seven times the earth and the heaven. So, total of 51 occurrences of this phrase, the heavens and the earth. Now we understand that this is a Hebrewism. You take two opposites, heaven, earth, and as it were, put them together. Um, Hebrew figure of speech in which two opposites are combined into an all-encompassing single concept. So in making the heavens and the earth, it contains everything that is there. We would say the universe. <laughs> And God created. That's the emphasis here. It didn't happen by chance. And God created. 
That's what man can't do. He can design, he can make lots of things, fantastic things, but he can't create life. Whereas God's spirit power can create life where there was no life before. And we're told that having created the heavens and the earth, that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Uh, and every word in this chapter is so significant. It's telling us that when God created the earth, it hadn't any form. And the idea of that, it was featureless. It was just a glow, covered in water. No hills, no valleys, nothing there. Just a featureless glow. It was void, and the idea of the void, the word void is empty. There was no life in it, no birds, no animals, no creatures. It was totally empty of life. It was dark, there was no light, and water was upon the face of the deep, the deep representing the water. So it was underwater. So that's how it started off as created. A glow covered in water without any form to it. But by the time we get to the end of six days, as we go step by step through the days of creation, then that picture changes. And at the end of that period, we have an earth which isn't featureless, it's fully formed. It has its mountains, it has its valleys, it has its shape. Uh, it isn't empty, it's absolutely teeming with life. At the end of the six days, the earth was full of animals, birds, uh, and birds. Uh, Sea life. It wasn't in darkness, there was light coming upon the earth. It was no longer all underwater, there was land and there was sea. So that's what the, the chapter is all about that transformation from an earth which is a bland earth to an earth which teems with life and features. And at the end of that period, obviously. Everything was now ready for mankind to exist upon the earth. And God makes it clear that it is his spirit, the spirit of God, that caused all the changes to be made. God is omnipotent, all-powerful, and his mighty power causes everything to happen that we read of in this chapter. And so when God says, uh, let there be light, then there was light. Now, where did that light, light come from? It's obviously, it wasn't until the fourth day that the sun, the moon, and the stars were created. We're forced to have to say, well, that light could only come from one source, and that was from God. And with the whole of this creation account, having that as the literal, that light came from God, then we can draw spiritual lessons. You can't draw spiritual lessons until you've got the literal. Having got the literal, you then can uh, form the spiritual lessons. So there is a wonderful lesson to us. When the sun was eventually created to replace that light from God, it is a wonderful thing. The power of the sun causes the plant life to photosynthesize and create energy. That feeds into the animal food chain and eventually to man. But Although it is a wonderful thing that God made in the sun, which does sustain life, there is a better light that sustains life. Because the difference between the two, the word of God, the word that comes from God, and the natural light, is that the natural light uh, only sustains mortal life. Can't give us immortality, whereas the word of God can lead to immortal light. So it's fitting that God, before he created the sun and sunlight, had light coming from himself to signify there was something greater than the natural. And remember, the children of Israel had come from Egypt, where there was worship of sun. They were going into the land of Canaan, where there were nations which worshipped the sun. How foolish to worship the sun when we know there's something greater than the sun, the one that created it in the first place. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Now we know that that is from space, when one looks down upon the earth, 
Uh, and this here, I've got a, an earth there fully formed that wouldn't look like that until the uh, seventh day. Um, but it's easier to uh, illustrate it like this. But there is this dividing line between half the earth is in light and the other half is in darkness. And that being the literal case, we can then draw spiritual lessons from it. With the spiritual light that comes from the word of God, like the natural light, we have to discern between truth and error, light and darkness. And this is our means of being able to distinguish that which is true and that which is false. We do it by the test of the word of God. And God calls the light day, and the darkness he calls night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the implication is that right from the very beginning, the earth was rotating in order to have day and night. And just as all the planets which God was going to create, they all revolve at different speeds, so their day length differs one from another as is set for the benefit of mankind. 24 hour day is, well we could do, always wish that there were more hours in the day, but 24 hours is a, a, a reasonable uh, length of day, time, day and night, for the benefit of mankind. So, a rotating earth, and it's interesting that God starts in the evening, the evening and the morning of the first day, and we now, to this day, that uh, in Israel, they start their day in the evening time. And again, one can see the, the spiritual lessons that God is putting forth in these things. Um, because we are in darkness first. A period of 12 hours of darkness, followed by 12 hours of light, roughly. Um, but that's, that's the natural state, isn't it? <laughs> We're not born in understanding. A baby doesn't know anything about the word of God. We are born in darkness to the things of God. We have to come to them in later life. And so darkness first, followed by light, makes sense. Great spiritual lessons. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So we've set it up. Um, now the always through scripture, when it talks about day, it can be of a, a variable length. Uh, in the day of uh, my youth or whatever. But when we say first day, second day, third day, then that has to be a 24-hour day. It can't be anything else. So, and again, when Scripture uses the phrase evening and morning, it, in all the cases it occurs, it's talking about a literal day. So, the interesting thing is the different terminology that is used to describe the days. And on this first day, in the Hebrew, the idea is day one, the evening and the morning, day one. Uh, and this is setting the pattern. That, that's, this is the blueprint for what's going to follow a 24-hour day. Uh, that was day one. And then the rest of the days would follow, which we'll look at in a moment. So we come to day two, and God makes a firmament. And as we understand in Hebrew, the idea behind firmament is thin, stretched out space, uh, which is fascinating as one looks out at the heavens and sees an expanding universe, that everything does seem to be stretched out. This is the area that later on the sun, the moon, and the stars are going to be placed. And this is the area, the lower part of that area, where the birds are going to fly. But the importance is that for life to be on Earth, we need an atmosphere. And this is God building the atmosphere, which in itself is a, a wonderful balance of different gases, uh, which enable life to exist. 
it's not found on any other known planet, the atmosphere that we have, which is able to sustain life. Now, Psalm 148 is uh, an interesting phrase because I used to think that uh, this stretched out firmament and uh, the waters above the firmament and the waters below the firmament were referring to a kind of water vapour canopy um, around the earth which would provide the flood water. But uh, when one sees what Psalm 148 says, then it is clear that that isn't the case. Um, so, praise ye Yahweh, praise Yahweh from the heights, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun, moon and stars, praise him all his stars of light. Praise him ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that are above the heavens. So, when the psalm was written, which is long after the flood, there were still waters above the heavens. And what function they have, we don't know. But God tells us that there were waters placed uh, way out into space. Uh, and I uh, now feel that the water, the 40 days of rain, would have come from the, when the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and um, this warm water from within the earth, shooting up into the atmosphere, would come down as rain upon the earth. So God calls the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, from days two to five, the, the isn't there. So it's a second day, uh, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day. But when we come to the sixth day and the seventh day, it's even more complex. It's a day, the sixth, a day, the seventh. In other words, there's something very special about the sixth and the seventh days. On the sixth day was the creation of man. On the seventh day was the God resting, which was the pointer to, first of all, the millennial age, and then the purpose that God has with the earth of being all in all. So, uh, the record makes these distinctions. So we have day one, the first day of any existence of this earth, 24 hour day. And then uh, a second day, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day. And then a day, the sixth, a day, the seventh. Now, interestingly, there isn't any declaration on the end of the second day that everything was good. I think it was because the work really wasn't completed. We've got an atmosphere, um, we've got a world, but it's still covered in water. And it's not until we come to day three, when we get the dry land, that God then says, it is good. So the work wasn't quite uh, in a finished state for man. So the goodness had to wait until we have <laughs> land as well as atmosphere. So day three just simply tells us there's a division of the seas and the earth. Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And again, there's a reference in Psalm 104, uh, verse 5 to 9. It, it talks about creation, and it, it talks about the elevation of the mountains uh, and the sinking of the valleys. And it would seem quite reasonable that on um, Day three, during the period of darkness, there was this volcanic action which lifted up the foundation uh, of the earth. Um, being very soft, the waters would run off it, and as they ran off, they would carve the valleys as they sought their way down to the sea. So by day three, we have got a landmass um, which God calls earth, and the gathering of waters he calls sea. And it would appear from this uh, account here that the landmass was all one, uh, and it was probably part of the post flood period that brought about the separation uh, of the landmasses into the continents that we have today. But that's uh, by the by. So we can see the logical progression as we go through them uh, heavens and earth, water, light, atmosphere, dry land. So we're now ready for the plants, they can exist. There's an atmosphere, there's a source of light, uh, and there's dry land forming. 
And so the rest of the day was uh, set to the bringing forth of the plants. Man has his method of distinguishing different types of plants. God has this simple, basic, three-part division. We have the grass, we have the herb, and we have the fruit tree. I think what we're being told there, the grass would cover anything that was uh, a ground covering um, vegetation. The herbs would cover the bushes and the shrubs, and the trees would cover the large woody plants. And so just a simple classification uh, by God of three different types of plants, which mainly being used by different animals that would follow um, different uses of trees, grass and herbs and fruit trees. And we know what a wonderful creation plants are, able to absorb through photosynthesis the power, the energy from the sun, and translate that into sugars, which are then carried around the plant, and when they get eaten, enter into the food chain. We're utterly dependent upon the photosynthesis, these solar-powered food factories, to give life not only to ourselves, but all the animal kingdom. And the emphasis is, in chapter 9, verse 11, that it's the herb yielding seed, fruit tree yielding fruit, and it's after his kind whose seed is in itself. So it appears that when God created these things, he created them with their fruit. So on day three, you would have seen an apple tree bearing apples. You would have seen brambles bearing um, apples. Everything was mature and complete. So it was a very mature earth that God created, uh, fully grown, fruiting, uh, and seed-bearing plants. And the second emphasis is that they brought forth after their kind. And we know the utter importance of that, that uh, everything does reproduce after its kind. And ten times in Genesis chapter 10, we have this emphasis, not only the plants, but also the animals, bring forth after their kind. Uh, year after year, grass grows, seeds fall, seeds fall on the ground, grows up. There's always grass. It doesn't turn into anything else. Vine trees, always vine trees, different varieties, but they're always vines. They don't change into anything else. And that, of course, is evolution's biggest stumbling block. How do things change? How do we get from one plant to another plant, one animal to another animal? And their only ideas is mutations. And that only written results in lack of information, not increase in information which you need if you're going to ascend up the ladder. And the very fact we have such variety, 200,000 different kinds of flowers, 20,000 different kinds of trees, and with amazing diversity, indicates to us an incredible God. You can't explain all this through evolution. Colour, variation in size, shape, colour, different growing conditions, so there are shade loving plants, and loving plants, plants that can grow up mountains, plants that can grow in deserts. Absolutely great variety of different growing conditions. And the amazing variety of different ways that the pollen is dispersed from all these things is absolutely amazing, in order that the plants might survive. Time in, time out, year in, year out. So it is an amazing world that God created. So by the end of day three, we've got oceans, we've got rivers, we've got soil, we've now got plants. So the earth is now prepared for our inhabitants. And God declares that it was good. So day four brings us to the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. And we have to say, you know, why day four? 
my life until then. Well, interestingly, what was before day four were plants, and plants can quite happily underneath artificial lighting. They can survive on artificial lighting. Whereas the animals that were to follow, they needed more than just a simple one source of light. It also indicates to us, as we said earlier, that if God was able to produce light from himself and then replace it by uh, a sun that illuminated the earth, then that shows us that God is greater than the sun. But what it says is that God needed lights, plural, upon the earth. So, as I say, until now, the equivalent of sunlight is okay for plants. But when we get the insects and man and animals, they're dependent upon the stars and the planets, all sorts of things for their migration, in ways that we cannot understand. And so it was necessary, before these creatures came into being that needed lights, that this was done. And of course, there is a spiritual aspect at the end of the fourth millennium, then the true light, the Lord Jesus Christ, appeared. So it, it seems to be an ideal day for creating the sun, moon, and the stars. Uh, um, what were their purposes? Well, very specific. They were to be lights in the firmament, to divide the day from the night, signs, seasons, days, years, lights upon the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. So it's quite specific, um, dividing the night from the day, uh, as we say, from space we know that there is this division line, half the world's in darkness, half in light, so it does create, with the rotating earth, uh, a period of darkness followed by a period of light. And light is very important to mankind. We have uh, a body clock, uh, and that is reset constantly by light. Uh, even blind people uh, are able to respond to light. It resets their clocks. The body has an internal clock that causes various psychological processes to oscillate in 24-hour cycles called circadian rhythms, which includes daily change in sleepiness. Light is the strongest environmental time cue that resets the body's internal 24-hour clock. So, as well as physically dividing night from day through the rotation of the Earth, it also resets our clocks, divides between night and day. But they are for signs, the idea comes down ultimately to something like signposts. Um, and so we see it was nearly a full moon, wasn't it, on the way here? Now, the light that we know coming from the moon is a reflection of the sun. We can't see the sun because it's shining upon our Australian brothers and sisters. Uh, but because we see the light reflected in the mirror of the moon, it tells us it's a sign that the sun still exists though we can't see it. And we know how the signposts by these planets and stars in ways which we don't understand enable uh, animals and birds and insects and humans to navigate. Uh, and, and we have these signposts. We have a pole star and down in the south we have the Southern Cross so that you have fixed points that enable you to navigate. Again, because God has set them in their places in a glorious way. They are for seasons. You know how uh, Stonehenge man understood the seasons and used Stonehenge to show when to sow the plants and when to reap um, because of the alignments of the sun, alignment of planets. Uh, very complicated thing, but. That's how God set it, so man could use these measures. For days, so again, with the sunrise, we can work out the time of the day, and through the uh, moon, 
we can work out where we are in the month because every day we see a slightly different face, don't we? Of the moon. Mm. So, and again, here at the bottom, at the right bottom. Oh, it's not pointing, but um, if, if we were used to looking at the moon, you would tell just where you were in the cycle of the moon. So, that's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> Years. Again, Stonehenge, uh, summer and winter solstice, mark out two checkpoints, six monthly checks on the calendar, so that man could know exactly where he was. God wanted man to have an ordered life, to be able to worship at set times, and God's given man and the animals the ability to know time. Lights upon the earth. We appreciate the sunlight, and tonight, there was uh, quite a light from the moon, a gentle light. Um, so lights upon the earth. As we say, the moonlight is a reflection of the sunlight. Uh, and the moon, as far as man knows, is completely unique, covered in these uh, dust which reflects light, reflected beads, which just gives us a gentle illumination at night without keeping us awake. And the interesting thing about the moon is they only ever see one face of it. Because its centre of gravity is off-centre, it's only a matter of uh, a couple of miles, three kilometres, but because its centre of gravity is off-centre, uh, as it orbits the Earth, it, it doesn't rotate upon its axis. We always see the same face. As it goes round the Earth, we're always seeing the same face. And what we now know through space travel, that the side of the moon that we see is in fact the dark side. It's only about 11% reflective. There's about 31% of these dark seas on the side that we see, whereas on the other side there's only about 1%. So if in the kingdom age or beyond, God just moved the centre of gravity of the moon so it was off centre on the other side, so that this side was the one that faced the earth, and night will be virtually as bright as day. I don't know, but it is fascinating to see how God has created these things and caused it so it doesn't rotate. We only ever see the dark side of the moon. So he made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. Uh, so he made them. It, it wasn't that they suddenly appeared through uh, darkness because they'd been made for millions of years before. God made them. Same word that he uses, two words that he uses. Barrow is one word and uh, this uh, Asha is another word. God made them. And they were to have rule or dominion or to dominate. Uh, I mean, how the sun dominates the day. And at night time, it's the moon that dominates. I mean, it's just cloudless. We see millions of stars, billions of stars. But it's the moon that dominates. That's the biggest thing that we can see. And his throwaway line was, and he made the stars also. 100,000 trillion, trillion stars, we understand. And if we could count them, at the rate of one trillion stars a second, and it will take 3.1 billion years to count the stars. And the wonderful thing about the stars is, although they are so distant, and the light are just little tiny pinpricks, yet it gives a very comforting glow to the whole of the sky as one looks out. It's just a gentle illumination. Without the stars, it will be totally black, apart from them. So it's a wonderful work of God. And he made the stars also, for the benefit of man. Trillions of stars, just to give that little touch to night time, this reassurance, it's not pitch darkness. And of course, they give us a wonderful navigational map. Um, navigators have used the stars for millennia to travel around. 
And God set them, he says. They were placed in a particular place, carefully placed. And everything we find is just right. The distance of the earth is from the sun uh, is exactly right. We're told if we were 5% on average closer, then the seas would boil. Uh, and if we were 1% further away, they would freeze. It, it's just precisely right. Uh, and the moon and the earth, just exactly the right distance apart. We know how the, the pull of the moon stirs up the oceans, helps to take sediment out from the rivers, uh, but stirs it round, oxygenates it, causes the plankton to grow, which is the basic food for the sea creatures. Now, uh, if the moon were a lot closer, we'd have huge tides. Shipping wouldn't be possible. If it was further away, then there'd be hardly any tide. It's just, just exactly right. Everything is precisely right. And even the sizes, because it's not just the distance, it's the relative size of the earth and the moon and the moon and the sun. Uh, all, all these are, are just precisely right. So everything is right for life. And I came across this uh, interesting website. Uh, astronomers disagree on just how rare life in the, is in the universe, but Earth nevertheless boasts several features that make it just right for life as we know it. The right ingredients, a planet needs liquid water, energy source, chemical building blocks, etc. to thrive. Just the right crust, um, the Earth's just right, the right temperature, the right moon, uh, the right star, uh, the right core, the right neighbours. I didn't know this, that Jupiter shields Earth from constant stellar bombardment. Without the gas giant in the neighbourhood, <laughs> scientists predict the Earth would endure 10,000 times as many asteroid and comet strikes. So that's pretty amazing. In short, Earth contains all the ingredients and the environmental necessities for life to emerge. This is obviously a site that believes in evolution, but it's just marvelling that everything is just right. Well, we can take many spiritual lessons from day four. Uh, the Word of God enables us to divide from light and darkness, truth and error. It, it tells us of the signs and the seasons. It, it's our signpost so that we can navigate through the trials of this life. And it's also, we have to reflect the light in our lives. Just as the moon reflects the light of the sun, we have to reflect in our lives the life of the Lord Jesus so that people can see that we're different. And that's the reason why. So we are a witness to the unseen Lord. He does exist. He is the creator. We do have to fear and serve him. And so we come to our final day. The day when the oceans are filled with sea creatures and with birds. And again, this emphasis, they reproduce after their kind. And they were commanded to fill the earth. That's what God was doing. Turning the earth from unfilled to a filled earth. Uh, it was no longer void and empty. It was absolutely teeming with life at the end of that day. And again, God declared at the end of that day, it was good. And so that brings us to the end of the fifth day. And God willing, next week, Bernard will take us through the sixth day, and presumably the seventh day, just to complete it. I brought along some of the books, some are so new, this only train today. This is uh, Michael Behe, who wrote the Darwin's Black Box. Um, Darwin devolves. New science about DNA that challenges evolution, but there's an abundance of evidence and support for what the Bible has to say. Um, okay, DVDs. If you go onto the Rugby Christophian site, there's a whole section on um, the follows of theistic evolution. Uh, it's got many links to talks by Christophians and other sites that support the Bible. Uh, and there are also some downloadable books by Chris Dolphins there, which uh, give you wonderful resources to be able to show that this book is true and trustworthy. Well, I haven't, uh, I've got a couple more slides, but the time has gone. But there is abundant evidence to 
show that the Earth is young. There's lots of evidence to show that the Earth can't be billions of years old. The very fact that we have carbon-14 in diamonds, the very fact that when we date coal, it's not in billions of years, uh, it's only a few thousand years. All sorts of things that show to us that when we accept the Bible, when we accept the story that there was a worldwide flood, that explains so much. It explains why all the fossils that I found are creatures that were alive. They weren't dead in fossilized. They were alive. So shell creatures which, when they die, they open up, but if all the fossils are of shells which are closed. Um, all the plants that remain on plants, they're, they're turgid. They're full of uh, water. They're alive when they were fossilized. Uh, animals are in the throes of drowning when they're fossilized. So, with the Bible and the account of the floods, we can explain all the things that are so problematical to mankind. So, this is a wonderful God that we've come to know and to serve and to fear. And we can trust his word from the beginning. Thank you.